Our brains are the most complex and mysterious organs of our body. A gelatinous mass of electrical impulses, the homes to our personalities and our memories. It's only been until recently that we've started unlocking the secrets of the human brain. And today, some of the most advanced research in the world is being conducted here at the Washington University School of Medicine. What makes these scientific advances possible is an imaging technology that scans the brain and allows the creation of brain maps so researchers can identify the structure and the functions of specific areas of the brain and understand how those regions communicate with each other. These pictures, made possible through magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, show cross-sections of a brain completely from one side to the other. The colored sections of this image indicate parts of our brains that form circuits, sending the rest of our brain signals as to what is real and how we should react. These regions are talking back and forth to each other continuously, you know, the entire time that you're awake. They're helping you to recognize things that are happening in the environment and what they mean, whether they're positive or negative events. Most of this is going on pre-attentively before you even think about it. Before you think about it's a fire, your brain has already registered it and said it's a fire. Before you think about it's, this smells like a cookie, your brain has already decided that. It, it can help us to understand why people that have depression um, you know, are so negative about things. How they, something might happen and, and you would see it as a perfectly neutral or, or you know, not a big, big deal. But someone who's depressed might see it as it was a very negative thing, it was something they're very worried about or anxious about or something that made them very sad. And it's probably because there's dysregulation between their amygdala and their ventral medial prefrontal cortex that, is, that, help, that helps them misinterpret you know, what, what they're seeing in the environment. Don't let amygdala and ventral medial prefrontal cortex throw you. They're just parts of the brain that are very difficult to pronounce, but very good when they're working at letting you know that a fire is dangerous and a cookie is delicious before you have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. An even newer generation of imaging techniques allows researchers to see these regions in three dimensions and compare structural differences between the brains of healthy subjects with those who have mood disorders or more serious mental illnesses. And we can now, with these very new types of image processings that we can do with the, the engineers from Johns Hopkins as well, we can recreate these surfaces, we can manipulate them, um, you know, basically to look at them in any direction that we want. MRIs can also trace blood flow in a thinking brain, showing which regions of the brain function during different mental activities. From those patterns, sophisticated computer models can be created, demonstrating more clearly the process of thought. And that's important because a lot of psychiatric disorders, you may not necessarily see clear changes in the shape or the size of the brain, but they might still be functioning in a way that's very different than healthy individuals. And this technology allows us to look directly at that. What you can see here is a particular part of the brain called the anterior cingulate. Uh, the anterior cingulate seems to become active as it detects the increased likelihood of making a mistake. This is particularly important in uh, the case, for example, of individuals with schizophrenia, where there seems to be uh, specific impairments in certain parts of the brain in the ability to monitor one's own behavior, to recognize when one's own behavior is inappropriate or may lead to undesirable consequences. We can't yet tell the difference when you're thinking about your wife versus your mother versus your child. So we're not able at that very minute level to see, oh, this part of the brain activates when I think about my friends, but this part of the brain activates when I think about my kids. But we can see differences in you know, verbal versus nonverbal material, emotional versus non-emotional material. So we can see some differences. I think we know a, a lot more. I mean, we still have a ways to go, but I think we have a much better understanding um, of the complexities of the way the brain functions. Um, I think we understand now that in most cases there isn't a single area of the brain that carries out like a, a specific way of thinking. So there's not a single area of the brain, for example, that's responsible for our memories of our childhood, but rather that there's a coordinated set of regions of the brain that work together 
um, kind of in harmony in order to allow us to do things like remember what we did as a child or to you know be able to learn new information as we're studying for school so I think that in some sense is an advantage to way sort of the older ways of thinking about how the brain functions it's a remarkable organ the human brain able to study itself in order to treat its own disorders <laughs>